This is Cast of Wonders, the fiction podcast for young adults featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome! Today we present the second and final part of Susan Oki's story, Patterns. If you missed part one, it's episode 84, just one back. Please go and listen to that one first. You can find out more about Susan and her writing adventures at susanmayoki.wordpress.com Check the show notes for details. As with last episode, your narrators are Alice Dare Stewart and Marguerite Kenner. And now, we've the rest of a tale to tell. They fixed the fence. They can't keep me out. I'm wanted there. I tighten my grip on Kate's hand. The pit is the last place she wants to be. There, a patch of green gold blazes under a narrow section of the fence. I pull Kate into a jog. She gasps when we stumble into a sudden depression in the ground. The fence stretches impotently across empty air. Underneath, and there is just enough space for us. Goddamn son of a... Kate mutters between clenched teeth as she follows me through the gap on her hands and knees. How did you... She stops and hisses a sigh through her teeth. I glare right back at her. Green gold energy surges up through my body. It makes me want to shout. Kate shifts uneasily. Patterns. I step close and take both her hands in mine. It's all right. Let me show you. The muscles in Kate's shoulders relax a little, and I resist the siren call of the pit just long enough to hug her to me. Just before Christmas, the discovery of an underground chamber caused a surge of fresh interest in the pit. The local paper devoted its front page to speculation about why the monastery had been raised to the ground and whether all the monks had been put to death or just defrocked. Kate insisted on reading the entire piece to me. As far as I could make out, the monks claimed to have a direct line to God, or it was maybe the devil. Whatever. Lots of people got really pissed off, and the usual happened. And then she said it was all a load of rubbish, that the whole thing was just part of Henry VIII's master plan to get rid of all the monasteries. It was too much. This hum in the back of my mind cycled up into a shriek, and the next time I looked up, she was gone. I could have told her that what was down in the pit had absolutely nothing to do with gods, or devils, or kings, but Kate isn't good at listening, especially when Kate has a point to make. I force myself to slow down. Kate struggling with the ladder, muddy feet slipping on the metal rungs. The call is stronger in the pit, and I have to fight the urge to jump. I picture the geek team on the ladder, mud slicked and sweating in their heavy boots and bulky fluorescent jackets, and it helps. Not much further, I whisper back to her. She nods and follows me down the second, shorter ladder into the icy black of the unearthed cell. The air tastes damp. Our heads brush against the ceiling. My fingers dislodge tiny avalanches of grit as I grope my way along the wall. It's here. I can feel it. Stumbling forwards, hands outstretched, my feet catch against raised stone. Golden light surges across the faces of a stone pyramid. It stands in the centre of the square cell, its summit level with my chest, its base taking up two-thirds of the floor space. I push myself up, hands pressed against its rough surface, embarrassed by my undignified sprawl. The light flares, sun bright, forcing me to squeeze my eyes shut. Mikey! Kate sounds scared. A deep note vibrates through the stone like distant boulders grinding together. The palms of my hands buzz. The sound resonates in my chest, its growl translated into the never-ending draw of a cello bow. And it tunes every bone I have to its song. I clench my jaw against the spreading ache in my skull, and as I do, I realize I can't move. Kate's fingers dig into my arms as the song flows through me, infinitely slow, infinitely dense. I see my mother shaking with silent sobs as she listens to the protecting veil. She listens to that one a lot, not realizing that I'm hunched in a ball outside her bedroom, waiting, hoping that she'll open the door and let me in. 
I hear the slam of the front door as my dad walks away for the last time. He left me here. Trapped. Isolated. Alone. Part of me knows that I need to breathe. Part of me never wants to breathe again. I cry out as Kate jerks my hands off the pyramid and it feels like part of me has been ripped away. Kate drags me across the threshold of the cell and into black silence. I pull in a huge, ragged breath. Kate holds me as I cough and sob. She holds me until I stop shaking. My gaze pushing ahead of me like a dog on the scent of fresh rabbit, the red of his fleece a spatter of color disappearing amongst the undergrowth. I told him that the local paper had reported a new find in the woods skirting the school grounds. His excited grin made me feel sick inside. I've tried to talk to Mikey about what happened at the pyramid, but he won't listen. I remember his eyes deep pools of gold that slowly faded back to blue as I dragged him away. And I remember the way he looked at me, like a stranger. I want Mikey back the way he was before. I want my D'Artagnan. It hurts the way he curls in on himself when I touch him. His white boy skin feels rough and dry. The corners of his mouth are cracked and sore. Black circles shadow his eyes. Mikey the zombie. I push the thought away. I've managed to convince his ma'am not to call the doctor, but now I'm not sure. Maybe he does need that kind of help. Mikey said not to, that he didn't trust the prof or anyone from Unicyke, but I had to do something. I found Adam at the B&B and told him everything, the accident, the patterns, the way the pyramid lit up when Mikey touched it. Adam confided that the grounds of the monastery were more extensive than their original estimate, and that his team had located a second pyramid in the woodland just beyond the school perimeter. He asked me to bring Mikey to look at the second pyramid, an experiment, he said, that would help further their research. And, he promised, help Mikey. There'll be a team of experts on standby. Mikey will be perfectly safe. Another promise. So why do I feel so guilty? I reach the edge of the clearing in time to see Mikey disappearing down a ladder. Mikey, wait! Someone grabs me from behind. I stagger forward under the weight, punching back with my bald fist into his groin again and again and again until the weight is gone and my attacker is curled, groaning on the floor. I turn and kick him in the head. Once, twice, three times, glad of my docks. My heart is thundering in my chest. I run for the ladder. A handful of bulbs spotlight the pyramid, staining the top half a sickly yellow. Box shapes bulk along one wall, some flashing with tiny points of green. I hesitate, just outside the circle of light, and listen. This one's different. There's a sense of resignation in its song, and it makes my chest ache. It feels like... Like the time I went to visit Auntie Doreen in hospital, I remember her tired smile and the shadow lurking behind her eyes. I wanted to turn and run, but instead I sat and stared at her, (laughs) clasped hands, all paper-thin skin and bobbly blue veins while she chatted with Mam, their voices low and conspiratorial. I bow my head, a silent witness to the pyramid's long, long song of grief. What you waiting for? The words slap at me. A bulky figure moves out of the shadows behind the pyramid, and I stumble back. Strong hands grab my shoulders and push me forwards into the circle of light. I struggle to regain my balance and catch sight of one of the professor's geeks moving to block the low doorway. Place your hands on the pyramid. There's a good boy. The prof smiles at my surprise. Oh, don't worry. Kate told me everything. She's very concerned about your welfare. Kate? The word squeezes out of my throat. I look for her, panic snapping my head left and right. Calm down. She's waiting outside. You can see her as soon as you finished here. Now, do exactly what you did before, and this time we'll record the results. I look back at the door to the cell and try to sense Kate's presence, but 
All I can feel is the muted thrum of the pyramid's lament. Did Kate really tell this man everything? I take a deep breath. There's one thing I know for sure. Kate wouldn't do anything to hurt me. Last time I tripped over my feet and fell onto the pyramid. Yes, yes. The prof waves an impatient hand at me. Physical contact. That's the key. Get to it. Flecks of silver trace the symbols chiselled into the pyramid's side. A gentle but insistent force pushes at my chest. I frown and take a half step back. It doesn't want me to touch it. Luke, Mikey. The prof runs the fingers of one hand through the grey stubble of his hair. How can I explain this? He softens his tone, speaks slowly. We believe that these pyramids are receptacles, containers for a very special type of energy. See those markings? He points at the rows of symbols covering the pyramid. That's a form of mathematics. Pete, over there, he nods at the man behind me. Pete's our mathematician. He's been working on deciphering those equations, but we need some hard data. We need to record what happens when you touch it. I shake my head. Slowly, mouth dry, as the dance of silver light brightens across the pyramid. Our scans have shown significant differences in the nature of the energy stored in the two pyramids. His tone sharpens. Mikey, this is important. We need to understand the mechanism for capturing and tapping this energy. Leave them alone. I won't let you hurt them. The underground boom of my voice takes me by surprise. A wave of heat rolls through my body. I lick the tang of salt from the corner of my mouth. The prof clears his throat because now, <laughs> now it's his turn to step away. Your eyes. The sound of shouting makes us both turn. Pete ducks through the door and then reappears with another, much fatter man. Between them, something is kicking and swearing. Christ! Pete jumps back, shaking a bleeding hand. The fat one grunts, both hands clutching at his stomach. The whirlwind that is Kate lunges at me, hands outstretched. Don't! She gasps. Pete grabs at her, catching her shoulder, knocking her off balance. Kate twists, falls backwards, even as I catch hold of her hand. The thump of her head against the edge of the pyramid is clear in the snatched breath silence. Silver strobes the cell, pinning each one of us in place, open-mouthed, wide-eyed, Cold argent blazes from Kate's eyes, flows across her body, engulfs our clasped hands. Bitter salt burns the back of my throat. All I see is Kate. Our bodies stretch away into impossible distance. I can feel myself begin to shred. And then we're rushing towards each other. Streaks of raging light, silver to gold, gold to silver. A heavy weight slams into me, breaking my hold on Kate. Shadows flood the room. Are you all right? It's the prof. We're tangled together on the floor. Kate, Kate, Kate. I want to shout her name, but all I can manage is a strangled croak. The prof pins my arms to my sides as I buck and kick. Mikey, calm down! Calm down! He crushes the breath out of me and I sag on the point of retching. We've got to get you both out of here. Pete scoops Kate up in his arms. She's not fighting anymore. In the dim light from the bulbs I see that her eyes are closed. One of her arms slips and it hangs loose as Pete ducks through the doorway. The sounds pluck at me, random, unruly notes with no real rhythm or melody. I try to slip back into the flow of the song, Silver Sweet, but it's faded beyond my reach. It's promise a dim memory, something about unity, about being together. Mikey! His face leaps into my mind, eyes bright, lips curved into that ferocious smile, and drags me back into the world. Should have listened to Andy. He argued that the translation read, and life flowed into the trifold hands of God, but no, I insisted the true meaning was energy. It made more sense, the flow and capture of energy within a linked storage system. I'm, I'm so sorry. The alternative was just to... Stargate. Yeah, I know. That's Mikey's voice. I open my eyes and groan as a sharp pain throbs through the back of my head. Arms hold me in a tight embrace. I breathe in sour sweat and tense. This isn't Mikey. Kate, you okay? Mikey's voice comes from somewhere in front. He sounds worried. 
I struggle weakly and then cry out as I'm bumped and jostled. Sorry about that. Another voice, the prof's. This road's all ruts and potholes. It's all right, Kate. Mikey says. We're taking you to the hospital. You and that guy you dropped in the woods. I want to reach out to him, but the arms hold me tight. Remember, the prof says, it's important that you and Kate don't touch each other, at least until we get a head wound checked out. We just don't know what we're dealing with here. It could be dangerous for both of you. Trees lumber past the window as the car bounces along the woodland track, skirting the school grounds. It's dark and stuffy in the car. I feel hot and sick and all squashed up. The sudden glare of the headlights blinds me. I squint, fighting back a roll of nausea as the car jerks to a stop. The headmaster is staring at me, lips pressed into a hard line. I stand at attention, eyes fixed on the school logo, the black outline of the old schoolhouse, on his tie, and I wait. Kate is propped up in a high-backed leather chair, one of two in the headmaster's study, and she has a distant look on her face. The prof and his geeks were bundled away by a posse of teachers. The words police and assault surfaced amid raised voices. You should have come to me with this, the headmaster says. Yes, sir. My gaze drops to his brogues, and I can't help tracing the neat crisscross patterns of the laces. And then the thick burgundy carpet around the headmaster's feet begins to ripple with crimson light. It snakes up his legs around his chest. We've been waiting for someone like you for a very long time, he says. I'm caught by his eyes, steel grey flecked with crimson. I'm hot. I'm too hot. And then he smiles. I can feel my body rocking to the pounding beat of my heart. You... Hear the song. I know you do, he says. Yes, it comes out as a hoarse whisper. I feel the bass note vibrate in the pit of my belly and then wind its way up my spine. I try to fight it, breath hissing between clenched teeth. The headmaster offers Kate his hand. No, no, not Kate. She's not... Something cracks inside me. Green gold energy surges through, washing away my words. He brings Kate to stand beside me. The bass note strengthens, humming through my skull. You are bound together by love and life. Without Kate, there would be no renewal. He speaks as if every muscle in his body is clenched against an impossible pain. Look at her. Silver ebbs and flows across her skin, a tide matched in my body. I raise my hands and stare at the runnels of gold flowing beneath my skin. A deeper thrumming strikes up through my feet, the trifold hands of God. I can feel it. It's the third pyramid, and it is directly beneath us. An image forms in my mind, the basement low with reflected ruby light. The headmaster kneeling before the pyramid, eyes closed, hands pressed against the fiery symbols. I shake my head and hide my hands behind my back. The headmaster scowls. We were trapped. By their grey song, imprisoned by stone words, forced to do their bidding. He bears his teeth and leans close. They denied us unity. I lick his spittle from my lips, watch him take a deep breath grimace against the manic pounding of my heart. We were ripe on the cusp of merging. That's when they caged us. The crimson pulse of his skin dims. So 
long, alone. Kate presses close and something urgent wakes up in me. She reaches to take hold of my hands and I let her. The floor shudders under our feet. There's a dull crack as the painting of the original schoolhouse thumps to the floor. The headmaster's smile stretches tight. He wraps our hands in his. I'm the bass note of gold, the solid core. The crimson and silver circle close, modulating their song, binding me to their harmony. I can taste them, salt sweet. A sour note threads through the melody, and I remember Kate. She's fading. I pour my strength into her gold to silver. Storm force waves of crimson tear through me. A silver whirlpool forces dissolution and recombination. Silgol, Sonver, crimmed. I feel motes of gold, silver, crimson bleed from our new shape, escaping into the spaces between, and I smile. I smile. I smile. Because a new cycle has begun. Mikey is sitting in the chair facing his bedroom window. If he leans forward, he can look down into the street, at the thick blanket of snow being slowly trampled into mush by determined shoppers. But he won't. He won't do anything unless someone prompts him. I perch on the end of the desk and study his face. Blue eyes pale and unfocused, a faint smile ghosting his lips. I search for some sign that he recognizes me, that he knows I'm here. Three weeks and still no change. The doctor's diagnosis, traumatic shock brought on by the explosion and the death of the headmaster. Firefighters had to pull us from the wreckage of the old schoolhouse, complicated by the existing trauma of his recent accident. Mikey needs familiar surroundings, familiar faces, and the support of people who love him, they said. So here I am. And so was his dad, ditching his new life in Scotland for the sake of his son, as if Mikey hadn't always needed him. I'm not sure what happened. I woke up in casualty and confirmed the prof's story about trying to get me to the hospital, but after that everything is blurred. The old school house, the pit, and the dig site in the woods were all destroyed in what officialdom described as a gas mains incident. But only one memory is bright, the way Mikey held me tight, a golden pillar of warmth that surrounded me and supported me and wouldn't let the darkness take me. The boys are outside, waiting, just like I told them. They'd been hanging around at the end of the street for the better part of an hour. I spotted them through the bedroom window, kicking about in the snow, creating a big circle of muddy slush around their indecision. I let them stew. Now they're waiting on the landing outside the bedroom door. I can hear the low rumble of their conversation. I catch an odd word or two and glare at the door. Rugby. It took a while to breathe away the tears. Rugby. That's what Mikey should be talking about. All three boys should be squashed onto his ma'am's sofa, attention fixed on the TV, jumping and shouting at the ref, while I sit at his feet, watching the rugby, but mostly watching him. Time to let them in. I trail my fingers across the back of Mikey's hand. He doesn't notice. And then open the door. Blake and Hari file in, silent now, looking everywhere except at Mikey. And when they do look, they can't look away. I take Mikey's hand and press it against my still flat belly. By the time I knew, he'd stopped listening. Now Mikey's wandering the spaces between, but he'll come back to me when the time's right. He'll come back because that's what fathers do. And so ends Patterns. Of this story, Susan says, Patterns was inspired by the phrase, and she looked at me again. I had a vivid image of a teenage boy watching his girlfriend walk away from him. At the last moment she turned and looked back. There was an aching tension between them that I had to explore. What did you think of the story? Do come tell us in the forums at castofwonders.org slash forums. Cast of Wonders is a production of Wolf Spain Publishing. The editor is Marguerite Kenner. The audio producer and host is Graham Dunlop. Artwork by Barry J. Northern. It's released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. 
Share it, but don't change or sell it. Theme is Appeal to Heavens by Alexei North from musicalley.com.